Thank you. I've just forgotten everything I was going to say. Um, hi, I'm Steve Dunford. I'm a teacher in Christchurch. I have the best job in the world. The talk, or the title for the talk, was going to be from Pascal to Python, and I had really good reasons for that. So if you came to hear anything about Pascal, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to get that out fairly quickly. Um, Pascal was being taught for one particular part of the program when I started at Burnside um, a while back, and it was used to teach the difference between compiled languages and interpreted languages. And it was done because the teacher before me knew Pascal, so that's what she used. I didn't know Pascal, um, so I thought I can make this better. So I did. Um, and so I used C for a number of reasons, because I play with Arduinos. I'm also an electronics teacher as well as a digital tech teacher. Um, so C is a much more useful language to us at school. Uh, and the uh, pythoning the stuff out of it part uh, came about because the other programming teacher at school, who's also called Steve, which is not confusing at all, um, came to me last year and he said, you know, it'd be great if we changed the programs and all we did was program. We should just Python the stuff out of it. Only that's not exactly what he said, but that's what we'll use here. Um, if for no other reason than I'm sure my boss is going to watch this video later on. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, we should totally do that. And so this year, that's pretty much what we've done. There's been programming in just about everything we've done. We taught databases by doing programming. We've taught web by doing programming. We've taught computer science by doing programming. And most of that programming, at least in my programs, has been done with Python. Um, other Steve, he teaches Unity and game development. We have game development courses through the senior school. So he uses that other weird language, that c sharpy one. Um, and we have great conversations about how he's wrong. But each to their own. Um, so I figured that this was probably not a good title for the talk either because there's no Python in there at all. So I just went with the low-hanging fruit. And we'll talk about what we do at Burnside High. Um, first of all, let's talk about me, because me. Uh, in my profile, it says something about being a wannabe farmer. This is the extent of my farming. This is part of my paddock and part of my neighbor's paddock. That's a bale of hay that my neighbor accidentally dropped off the back of his tractor while driving along the fence line, and it was immediately requisitioned by my goats. That's Tom, Dick, and Gary. That's the extent of my farming. So wannabe farmer, I would love to be. Three goats is it. They're pretty cool. So where did I come from? Um, I came from industry, and I've only been teaching for a short time. I have a background in electronics, which I um, primarily learned in the Air Force with at least one person who's here today. Uh, I also have some light engineering background. I used to modify four-wheel drives and do a little bit of welding and fabrication just for fun because I enjoyed doing that. And I ran my own IT business for many years uh, as well as working for other businesses, both in home support business and corporate. Um, and so I felt like my skills would be great for teaching, right? Um, it was a bit of a culture shock. So I started teaching in 2015. Like I said, I'm fairly new to it. By 2015, I was shocked and horrified. <laughs> and by 2015, I'd almost gone back to industry. Um, my first school I went to teach at was, if you ever had one of those things where it was just too good to be true, and this job seemed like it was going to be amazing, and, and that was the last job you would ever need. That was that job. Turns out um, it was well marketed. <laughs> right? Teaching is great. The kids are great. Schools are weird. 
Okay, so in teaching, digital tech teaching with computers, it was never really particularly well done in the early days. So this stuff I've got from teachers who've been doing it a lot longer than me. In 1974 or thereabouts, schools started to get computers, I'm told, um, and they just had fairly minor use, mainly by the maths department. Um, by about the mid-80s, teachers were starting to take them on and use them for all kinds of things, but there were no real structured classes. Um, when I started high school, my school had two of those for 1,000 students, or 1,100 students. But by the time I left, we had 12 of these, and one of them actually had a disk drive, um, which meant 11 people would write programs all lunchtime and then lose them. One person, generally the first person in the room, which meant getting there at the start of lunch was a, a running battle, um, got to actually save their program so they could use them again next time. That was pretty cool. But again, no real formal use for them. I, I vividly recall one class that we had that lasted a couple of weeks, and that was my only formal computing teaching at school. And I'm guessing that if you're around my age, that's probably your experience too. Um, in 2011, some new standards were introduced. And these standards were designed to actually give students the opportunity to formally learn and be recognized for um, a whole range of things across the digital spectrum. Not just programming, but databases and web development and electronics and networking. Um, a lot of Cisco stuff crept in there that was a kind of interesting, interesting mix of doing networking and understanding really advanced concepts in networking. Um, these standards were great, and they were pushed for by a bunch of amazing teachers who I really look up to. And in fact, the teacher I spoke about earlier who was using Pascal, a lady called Vilna Goff-Jones, was one of the teachers who was instrumental in getting these into schools. And they were fantastic um, over what we had before. It meant that students could actually go into a program and gain credits for doing stuff in the digital arena. Last year, they got, or the ones that had just been rewritten started to be introduced. So we've actually had those standards for around six years, used them, found most of the pitfalls in them, and they're starting to be rewritten. In fact, I think they're nearly finished being rewritten and they're starting to be introduced now. Um, some of the problems got fixed. There is the odd thing in the new standards that I'm not overly enamored with, but by and large, these are fantastic. Um, I'll come back to the standards in a minute, but I'll just talk about what we do at the junior school because those standards are for our senior kids doing NCEA. Right? At year nine, uh, we make all of our students do a six-month digital technology course. And the idea is that we expose every single student that comes into our school to a range of digital tech stuff that gives them the opportunity, if they haven't had it before, to actually find out whether or not they're interested in digital tech. Um, we use Python a little bit with them. Particularly me, I don't want to hammer kids that have never had any exposure to digital tech with a text-only programming language. So I also use Scratch with them. Um, some teachers don't, they just immerse them in Python. Uh, and we also have an electronics program which I take where our students will learn a bit of basic because they're using pickaxe and pickaxes are programmed in basic. So those are the languages they had at year nine. At year 10, it's just Python and digital tech. So uh, we use, uh, we used to use Wing. We now use Repl.it uh, because it, A, means that they can't say the dog ate my homework because Repl.it is backed up in the cloud. Um, and it makes it really easy for me to mark their work as well. And the C, plus plus is, again, for the electronics program because at year 10, um, I transition my students over to Arduino. And so we start to learn a bit of simple C. 
we work with Arduinos. Arduinos are great because $3.50 delivered from the other side of the world is something schools can afford. Um, and it makes for a really good talk on ethics as to who's missing out when an Arduino can be delivered from the other side of the world for $3.50, when exactly the same Arduino comes from JCAR for $35. Anyway, that's, that's a pub talk later. Okay, um, and I put that in for other Steve, because he likes that. All right, back to achievement standards. So, achievement standards run across years 11 to 13, and for those of you my age, that is fifth form to seventh form. They're also called NCEA level one through to three, and they're also curriculum levels six to eight. That still vaguely confuses me. Um, and it does confuse a few other people as well. And at level one, we have a programming standard, and the programming standard includes the following four things. That they can write code for a program that performs a specified task using a suitable programming language. There's a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in that statement. Um, <coughs> and NZQA has its own language, which is a little bit subtle, and it needs unpacking. We'll come back to that one. They have to be able to set out the program code clearly. With Python, that's fairly easy because they're kind of forced to, right? They have to document the program with comments. I cannot tell you the number of students I have failed because they handed in an amazing program with no comments in it, right? I beat this into them from day one. Comment block at the top, program name, version, date, blah, blah, blah. Comments on the lines that need them comments on functions to say what the function does, and yet still I get programs with no comments. Testing and debugging the program to ensure that it works on a sample of expected cases. This is the achieved criteria, not the merit or excellence criteria, those are step ups, I'll have a look at those in a moment, but if a student can do those four things, they get four credits. They need 14 to pass the course, so that's a fairly reasonable chunk of their work, right? Um, the comments thing means that quite often my students have to do a resub. And a resub is where they've missed something simple, you give it back to them, you give them a couple of days, and they have to give it back with things fixed. Uh, and typically, whilst I don't tell the students what they got wrong, because I may as well fix it for them if I do that, I'll normally give a global bollocking to the course and say, what part of comments did you guys not understand, right? Comments and code, it drives me absolutely bananas. Um, so just at this point, who has kids in the school system? Keep your hands up. Who has read and understood standards? Put them down if you read them and understood them. Right, so actually either way it works. So hopefully this bit of the talk will actually be useful because the standards aren't hard, but you kind of have to cut through all the nonsense. So if I just flick to a standard, here's one I prepared earlier. Let's just roll up to the top here. Right, the standards have all this stuff in them. At the very top, it tells you what level the standard is, level one, is fifth form or year 11, right? It's worth four credits. And it's an internal, which means they do it at school and the teacher marks it. If it says external, that's either an exam in most other subjects, or for us it's often a report or a common assessment task and it gets marked by someone else, somewhere else in the country, right? Um, that's really all you need from at least the whole first page. So you can whiz past all of the stuff because it's mostly meaningless as far as most people are concerned. Here are those criteria that I just read out to you. That is the achieved criteria. And this last one, testing and debugging the program to ensure it works on a sample of expected cases. In an achieved sense, that pretty much means they handed in a program that works, right? There's very little testing other than that required. I like to see test tables done, but realistically, if it works, that's proof 
that they have tested it because most kids at this level do not write code that works first time. Right? Some do, but most do not. So it's not hard to actually pass the standard. And the merit step ups, um, where they're developing an informed, informed um, computer program, document it with variable names and comments that describe code function and behavior. This is something that none of my students, at least, should ever fail, because this is one of the very first things when I teach programming. I actually talk to students about variables and what they are and how they work and what happens under the hood, um, and the fact that they have to actually have sensible names. Right? This isn't 1974 anymore. We're not that hungry for memory that all variable names should be single letters. Um, so all variable names, by default, at least in my classes, should have sensible names, right? Um, and comments that describe code function and behavior. So again, comments, but let's not talk about that. Um, following conventions for the chosen programming language. Fortunately, Python has a document, PEP8, right? Um, and I terrify them by telling them to read PEP8 and there'll be a quiz tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But actually, I point them at the bit that tells them how to define variable names, right? Because everything else is reasonably self-explanatory at this level, and as long as they get variable names right, then they're pretty well good to go. And testing and debugging the program in an organized way, this is where they really need test tables. We don't use uh, any kind of formal testing, but we do get them to create a table. Here's a test to make sure this part of my program works. Here's what I expect to get. Here's what I got. Um, is that good or bad? And maybe some notes about why, right? They do that. They put that into their documentation, and it shows that they actually tested the program, right? Um, relevant boundary cases. If your program expects a number between 1 and 100, what does it do if it gets 0 or 101, right? That's kind of the boundary case thing we do. Um, often they're creating little menus so that allows them to actually cover that. And then the excellent step up, ensure it's a well-structured logical response to the task. That's a little bit of a touchy-feely one. Um, did they design it well, or is it quite hacky? Have they removed all the code repetition? Right. Making it flexible and robust, and comprehensively testing and debugging it, that's where they're doing exception handling and basically making it take anything and either use it or discard it in an elegant way. So that standard there, that programming standard, is not that hard. And that's all you need to care about when you're looking at the standards, apart from the fact that there are some words in there that you might want broken down, right? Programming language. It may be graphical, drag and dot, or text-based. This means at year 11, we can use Scratch. And some teachers do. Uh, and in fact, one of my really good students this year did exactly that. He used Scratch because he's really good at Python and he wanted a challenge. So he wrote a program which bubble sorts and then did a binary search on a particular value, uh, all in Scratch, and it was really, really good. But it had no comments. So, so he failed. Um, Right? I don't make the rules. These are legal documents, right? I, I don't want to be accused of fraudulently giving out credits. Um, having said that, we do have a, uh, this, this thing called holistic marking where we can look at the skills of the student and if we know they're working at a certain level or we have um, evidence that they can do this, then we can actually grade them based on that. Um, he didn't fail. Right. Um, what does a computer program actually have to comprise of? Variables storing at least two types of data. Right. Usually, by year 11 at Burnside, our students are pretty good at using all kinds of data and collections of data as well. Sequence, selection, and iteration, so loops and if statements. Um, 
input from a user, sensors, or another external source. Right? That sensors one is really handy because that kind of crosses over into the electronics space. So kids that are doing electronics can now actually get the standard as well. Um, data stored in collections, lists, arrays, dictionaries, right? We use lists extensively for all kinds of stuff. Um, and user-defined methods, functions, or procedures. Now, that's one I'm not overly happy about because what it's saying is it has to have a function. Now, I have students who submit code regularly, really, really nice code that does really cool things. It doesn't have any functions in it. But to pass the standard, they have to have a function, so they have to put one in, whether it needs it or not. So uh, I'm not convinced about that one, but it's not a hard thing to add one in. It just seems a little bit tokenistic to do so. Right. And some examples of how to make a program flexible or robust, which in NZQA speak, if it's, uh, if it's examples of ways, then that's just some guidance on things you might consider. Right? But in NZQA speak, where it says a computer program uses, that's fairly definitive, which means it has to have those things. Right? So if you're reading these, if you've got a student, if you've got a, a child that's doing these, um, if you are a child that's doing these, all you need to really do is jump straight to section two and start reading from there. That's typically the second page of the document. Everything before it is administrative and is not overly critically important to what you're about to do. Section two has three bits to it, the achieved criteria, the merit criteria, and the excellence criteria. If you can understand those and you can do them, then you can pass the standard, right? And if there are any big words in there you don't understand, it's almost guaranteed that they'll actually be explained below. So, there you go. You're an expert in standards now. Um, I'll jump straight to level three programming because the level two standard and the level three standard are mostly the same apart from the word complex. Uh, I think at level two the word is advanced. So, again, you kind of have to interpret that a little bit. And as teachers, we have to make sure that whatever we give as an assessment is appropriate. Right? And that's actually written into the standard as well. So at level three, they're writing code for a program that performs a specified task. You may have heard that before, right? Same as the level one. Using complex techniques, setting it out clearly, documenting it with comments, uh, and testing and debugging to ensure it works on a sample of expected cases. So this isn't a whole lot different to the level one standard for the achieved criteria. For merit and excellence, it gets a little bit more difficult, but um, this standard used to be an OO standard. So before it was rewritten, this is the new version, before it was rewritten, what our students had to do was create an object-oriented program with a GUI. And the GUI of choice seemed to be, when I came into this, TKinter. I don't know if anyone's used TKinter. I don't know if anyone in industry ever uses it. But it's pretty horrible. And I hated it with a passion. And so I started trying to think about ways that we could avoid having to use TKinter. In fact, I made it kind of a pet passion to find a way to get around using TKinter, which is what everybody used. Um, and in thinking about that, I started to think, well, is a web page a GUI? And I decided that actually it was. I made that decision. Um, but fortunately, a bunch of other people um, had probably thought about it at the same time. But there was a group of us that agreed that, in fact, that was, that was a reasonable assumption, that a, a web page was a GUI, has widgets, it has um, feedback that the user, you know, things the user can do, feedback it can get. Um, and that led me down a path. Um, I'm not quite sure why this slide is next, but I found this quote, and I really liked it. Like all quotes I find on the internet, I'm not going to say it definitely was him, but it does sound like something he would say. 
Um, and it took, I don't know, 90 odd years, but he was right. right. Most of our students don't use textbooks anymore. We don't have any textbooks in our department. Um, and I don't know about any of you that have been to university, but when I went to university, I took out a loan to buy all the textbooks I needed. And it took me ages to pay it off. And by the time I was finished with them, those textbooks were worth nothing, right? Because the publishers had written new textbooks, as they did every year, to make the one that you just paid $120 for completely worthless. Um, I will probably never buy, well, having said that, I bought one recently, but I'll probably never buy textbooks again. And I don't think students do anymore. Is anyone at university at the moment? Are you guys buying textbooks? No? No? Excellent. I'm pleased to hear that. OK. So um, that probably gives you a bit of an ex uh, understanding of where I'm going next. But in terms of web pages, there is a standard called the media standard that um, our students set where they would write web pages and Again, it was worth around four credits, but it was just a web page, right? Um, I kind of like the idea of combining things into big projects. So Flask was something I'd heard about. I didn't know anything about it, so I started investigating it. And I combined it with another passion of mine, I'm really an old, grey-bearded gentleman um, on the inside. So I, I love vintage radio, right? I, I made crystal sets as a kid, um, did that with my dad. It was something quite sort of special to me as a youngster, and I went away from it. And I came back, and somehow I got a, a valve radio. I can't remember why I bought it. That one had babies, I think, um, because before long, my house was full of vintage radios, um, and I somehow had immersed myself in this world, and I know quite a bit about them now. When I was looking for a project to teach myself a web framework, this seemed like a really good idea. Um, this has chewed up an inordinate amount of my spare time over the last three years. Uh, but a lot of people like it, and a lot of people use it for lots of things. It is uh, much like Tom's talk, where he showed the amount of code his project, his little idea, suddenly went um, I kind of wish I'd done the same. I could just use your slide, because mine looks like that as well. If you put all the code out, it's become this massive monster. Uh, and I refactored it once, because those of you who came to the lab yesterday where I talked about Flask, um, I wrote the entire thing in one Python document top down, it was this massive, it was like 1,500 lines of code with classes scattered all through it. It was an ugly mess, and it's on, no, no, it's not on GitHub, don't go looking for it. Um, so I kind of coded myself into a corner with it, but I learned a lot, so I rewrote it from the ground up, and I wrote it a lot better. It's still not anything I would show someone who knows how to program in Python, but I'll show you this, because it looks cool, right? Um, and for people doing vintage radio, it's got as much information as I could put into it. And it gave me a chance to see how Flask interacted with databases uh, and how it interacted with the web and all the different things that I could do with it um, and how far I could go with it. And it turns out you can actually go quite far, which was really cool. So if you want to, vintageradio.co.nz, feel free to have a look. But not now. If I catch anyone on their devices, you'll get detention. <laughs> you. See me after school. OK. Lost the presentation. All right. So Flask. Why Flask? Why choose Flask? Um, one of the reasons for having a web framework at all and building web apps was that I have done Android development before, and I really enjoy Android development. And I could teach Android development. But half my class have Android phones. The other half have web 
expensive ones. Right? So that wouldn't work for them. I could teach development for that other half of the class, but that wouldn't work for the Android people. I could teach both, but that would take me twice as long. Then what about Linux? What about Mac? What about Windows? Right? All those devices, and a whole bunch besides, have the web. Right? This was a thing. Microsoft actually developed this. Um, the ILU. It's a Wi-Fi enabled toilet so that people at concerts could browse the web while they were in the loo. Failed project. Interesting idea, right? An extension of tucking a newspaper under your arm, I guess. Um, everything has a browser these days. Fridges have browsers, watches have browsers, phones have browsers, computers have browsers. Um, everything's got one. So why not make web apps? Because then the students are going to come out the other side with a valuable skill, a transferable skill, right? One of the things, I guess, me coming from industry and having uh, worked in the real world um, is that I'm looking at all these students and going, would I employ you? Would I give you a job? Would I give you money to do stuff for me? And so what I want them to come out the other end of school with is some valuable skills. Whether they go on to tertiary or not, I want them to actually um, know stuff that is useful and transferable. So Flask. Right? Why not Django? And somebody asked me this yesterday in the lab. Why not Django? Because Django is the web framework, right? It's, if you talk about a Python web framework, everybody knows Django or has heard of Django. It's not better in the sense that it's better. It's better for teaching because it has nothing. Right? You can do a simple um, Hello World app with just Flask, and Flask is small and tidy, and it does what you want. Right? Um, I liken it to Django being the proverbial sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Flask is a cool little pocket knife, but you can get an attachment called a walnut cracker which you can install really easily, and it does that really well. Right? It means that I don't have all this other stuff getting in the way. I can start small, and I can teach them to add on the things they need. And as I do that, some of them start to teach me things that they've found they can add on to do things that they needed, which is also really cool. Um, as a teacher, there is nothing better than your students teaching you stuff. Right? I, I, absolutely love that. And I have students who come in every day and go, have you seen this thing? I found it last night. Right? I don't give homework, but I have quite a few students who go home and do homework for my subject, possibly at the expense of other subjects. Right? <laughs> um, I consider it to be a privilege, and I am really, really lucky that I teach in an area which is not compulsory. Um, the students I get are students who want to be there most of the time, right? You get the odd one who, I didn't know what to take, so my mate took this and I'm, I'm here too, right? You get the odd one whose mum said, you should learn programming, right? But by and large, the students I get want to be in my class, and that is awesome, right? So I do get a lot of stuff that comes back at me. Have you seen this? No, I've never seen that. Show me how to use it. And the kids get really excited about it, and I get really excited about it, because I learn a heap of stuff, right? And like I said, it's an employable skill, right? So if I was looking for someone in a web company, and I wanted a junior, and I had someone straight out of school that could show me this web app they created at school, um, which could be quite advanced by the time they come out of year 13, because we do this at year 12 and we do it at year 13. Right? I spend two terms, or the students spend two terms, building a web app. We spend the first term of the year learning skills like how to build a database, right? how to design one, how to put it together, test it, do queries on it, um, how to do web 
HTML and CSS and how to program, and then they'll spend terms two and three actually building this cool web app. And then they go on to year 13, and they can either choose a new one or they can continue working on it. So by the time they come out at the end of year 13, they could have a really nice uh, web app to go in their resume to show to potential employers. So this is something one of my level two students has been working on for a friend of his who's a photographer. And at level two or year 12, I get them to do pure SQL rather than using any kind of ORM because in any programming job I've ever gone to uh, for an interview for, I have been asked to explain SQL. Um, it just seems to be something employers want to know if you can do SQL. Or, here's some SQL. What does this do? Right? I've never been asked, here's some ORM. Like, here's some SQL Alchemy. What does this do? Right? So at year 12, we do SQL. Uh, this year, I actually have one student who's used SQL Alchemy before, and if you've ever used it over SQL, it's, it's magical. And he was kind of disgruntled that I made him go backwards. But I said, Think about it this way. Next year, you'll be awesome. Right? Uh, so that's, that's actually an entire, just really just a query, which creates the page behind it. So there's a lot of CSS and HTML gone in there as well. Um, here's a, a fairly simple level three project uh, where one of my students, who is also a, a fairly avid music student, had created a way to store information about music. And this was a fairly advanced one. Um, and there is some SQL alchemy in there as well, and some quite clever SQL alchemy. But about the fourth line down, there's a really, really simple um, SQL alchemy query that replaces, in a very similar sense, those six or seven lines from the previous one. So SQL alchemy is actually a really, really handy way of replacing SQL and doing queries well. And if you came to my talk yesterday, you'll know that the setup can be a wee bit nightmarish, but once it's done, um, it makes life really, really easy. So we spend quite a bit of time going over setting up SQL Alchemy. And that's about all I really had to say. Um, dog tags for imaging users. That's Arthur. Um, pretty well done. So I guess we have time for questions. Is anyone you doing the microphone thing? Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, it's only a small thing, but I, as I was listening to you talk, I was just thinking to myself, do you um, get your students to use a, a source control system? And I was going how to do talk you go about that? that? Let me just, knew I'd missed something. Here's some I prepared earlier. Actually, one of my students prepared earlier. Yes, we use Git. Um, and we use it right from year 11, uh, starting this year. I hadn't previously. Um, in a really simple way, I just get them to do regular commits into a local, um, a local Git repository, which they then submit with their code and it gives me a really simple way using Fork. I don't know if anyone's used Fork before. It's fairly new. I love it, right? I can see everything nice and neatly in a GUI. The students can use it to see what they've done. Um, I can pull out any particular commit, look at all the files that have changed and what those changes are to make sure they're not just doing a whole series of commits um, to make it look like they did something. Um, I had one student at the start of the year who asked me, couldn't I just make something that looked like I'd done all that work? And I went, you could. Let me know how that works out for you. So he actually, he's one of my better students, he actually went away and tried to figure out if he could fudge Git. Um, turns out he could, but he decided that it was actually going to be more work than just doing the work. Um, 
so he may still do that because um, more work is better, right? But yeah, so yeah, we do. We use Git right across the senior school, and I get them to commit every class. At the end of every class, they commit their work. Some are good at that, some not so much. Um, but they are aware, and I constantly let them, like, constantly remind them that this is something that forms part of the evidence that I use to check off their work for, towards the standards. So, yep. Hi. Um, if your school was sort of like uh, teaching to a level that's sort of like 10, what would most schools in New Zealand be for digital tech? Are you asking if we're better? <laughs> well, just asking what's the lay of the land, you know, what's it like? Because I've seen some pretty, um, one of my sons was taught Swift and he, it was just horrible. And the whole thing was just an unpleasant experience for everyone concerned. So, you know, what's it like overall? Well, there are problems like that, right? And how we solve those problems is you all become teachers. Not every digital technologies teacher is a trained computer science or software engineer. Um, it's, it's an unfortunate fact that we could not possibly have that become a thing. Now, there are programming teachers out there in high schools who are not qualified, who are brilliant, don't get me wrong. Um, but not all schools can get someone who's passionate about digital tech to teach digital tech. It just, it can't happen. Um, it's part of that whole problem, that whole discourse that's been going on lately about paying teachers more and trying to attract uh, new teachers into the profession. So, yeah, there are going to be schools where digital tech is not taught as well as maybe it could be. And, um, you know, I don't think there's a quick fix for that, unfortunately. Most of the time, teachers are taught really well. And digital tech teachers in New Zealand have a, a national organization that uh, most digital tech teachers belong to, uh, which is really, really good and really well supported. So even those teachers who are not, um, not as conversant with what they're doing as others have a good support network to make sure that what they're doing is supported. Um, in terms of answering the question I asked you back there, um, yeah, we're the best. <laughs> right. And I would just add to that that in the recent Canterbury programming competitions, Burnside came first and second. And last year at the national competition, Burnside came first and second. So empirical evidence that we are, in fact, the best. And the second best. How do you cope with the immense variation you, you can presumably get in kids who've already done programming before versus never seen before? Do you find some coming from school, pri primary schools that have already done significant amounts of programming? Uh, sometimes I cope well with that, sometimes I don't. Um, it, it just increases your workload mm -hmm. because you do have students who really struggle and you have students who really fly, right? Um, what I try and do is, like personally, I try and give the students who are flying things to do that will stretch them. Mm -hmm. and. We have things, I don't know if anyone's seen, like Code Academy and Code Vengers, those, those kinds of websites that um, we pay for in the school and give to the students who are struggling so that if they're struggling and they want to try and get better, they have those tools to help. Um, we spend time with them, but most class sizes in digital tech are reasonably high, so it's, a, it's an age-old problem that's really, really hard to solve. You know, you can throw more hours at the problem. Uh, you can throw technology at the problem. At the end of the day, if the student wants to learn, then, uh, like I was saying before, they'll go home and they'll, they'll learn. I had um, a student who came into my year 13 class towards the end of term one this year, never programmed before. Really bright girl, and she worked really, really hard and I would say what she's doing now is as good as anything in the class. So, and, and that's at, the, at level three. So no experience with level one or two, nothing to build on. She had to learn everything from scratch. And so we do have students that will actually do the work and, and get themselves up to speed if they need to. But we'll have students that 
you know, you always get students who it's actually just not their thing. And so they really, really struggle. And I have a few of those and, you know, what do you do? Do you give them detention because they couldn't do it? Or, yeah, like I, I, I struggle with that on a daily basis. It's, it's hard. Not all students are the same. But then it would be a boring world if they were. I'm probably the last of the generation from the mid-80s that did computers as a subject in seventh form, where you got assessed as part of your bursary exams. And we learned algorithms, things like how to do a sort, or um, do, I mean, do, do you teach algorithms or, or what an object is, or that sort of conceptual stuff, as opposed to the syntax or the comments, etc.? Absolutely. So the course that I teach is called Software Engineering and Computer Science. So we do have those computer science topics built into the course as well. And in fact, at year 11, the, the whole first term was done on searching and sorting, and then coding solutions to that. So they were programming at the same time. Um, we teach algorithms across all three senior levels, not so much at year nine and 10, um, although it may creep down things tend to, once we get them solidified in the senior school, they do tend to creep downwards. Uh, but yeah, absolutely the answer is yes, we teach algorithms and computer science topics. Hi, I've um, got two sort of questions. The first is what motivated that transition from industry into teaching? Because that's quite a big jump and you know, despite the lack of um, digital teachers that we have, it's still a pretty big move to make. Um, and secondly, if there were people who were considering that transition, what would be some advice that you'd give, especially today with like the new digital curriculum and things like that? Okay, so transitioning from industry to teaching, you need to do a diploma in secondary teaching, which me uh, it's a post-grad diploma, so you have to have a degree. So for me, going into teaching, I actually had to go, go and do a degree first um, because I'd worked pretty much my whole life learning stuff by doing it. Um, you do a one-year diploma on top of your degree, and then you're a provisional teacher, which means you can go out and teach in, in schools. Advice? Um, don't expect it to be like the real world. Right? Schools are a bit of a special case, and I'm not saying schools should be like businesses, because I'm pretty sure that wouldn't necessarily work. But there are things that coming from the real world you'll find quite weird in schools. Right? Just either go with it or um, try and change it. I do tend to butt my head against things if I don't like them. Um, what I've found is that schools are larger movable objects and all you end up with is a headache. So, but. The one thing I would say, and I said it right at the start of the talk, is I have the best job in the world. Right? Despite the system, I love being in the classroom, I love working with students, I love teaching them, I love being taught by them. Right? The classroom is my happy place. I, I really, really cannot emphasize enough how much I enjoy what I do. So. If you want to become a teacher, if you even think that maybe it's something that you might like to do, by all means, come and talk to me. I'm here um, all weekend. So ask me as many questions as you like. But if you're considering it, consider it seriously. It is a very, very cool occupation. Um, yeah, just like even if it's just something you'd considered vaguely in passing, do it. It's amazing. Uh, just one last question. What do you think about 
parents, tech people coming into schools to teach these things when they're not the teacher. So I'm involved in a code club, a bunch of us parents have come in and we're basically delivering this into a primary school from year four up um, with Scratch and then micro bits and um, Edison things for the... Um, so, but we sort of come in, do it for an hour and then we're gone again uh, for a term. Um, what do you think of that? As, is, it, is it useful at least they've got something for that term in the primary school age of being introduced to it, or is it...? Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. Okay. That, you know, if we can get parents who know what they're talking about to actually come in and um, talk to kids. So, um, Glenn? Yep. Doing projects with microcontrollers and um, teaching kids new skills, or at least exposing them to those technologies even if it's just for a short while. You know, I, I got into computers because a parent bought a ZX81 into my intermediate and showed me how to go 10, print, Steve is awesome, semicolon, <laughs> 20, go to 10. And it's like, mind blown, right? That was how I got into computers. And then I pestered my parents, pestered them incessantly until I got a computer. That, that was how I got into it. A parent did that. So if you are a parent with skills and you have the opportunity to go and um, show those skills to some kids, you never know what kind of impact that's going to have. So what do I think of it? <laughs> right? Do it. That's awesome. You, know, um, you may find there are things in schools where you have to be with a teacher when you're with students, um, there's rules and regulations to stop random people being in classrooms alone with, with students. If there's a teacher who wants you to come and do that, look, just do it. It's, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. We good? Drinkies time? Awesome. Thanks, guys.